All right, the title is A Famine Feigns Failure. That is, famine is going to fake as though it can cause failure. Our text is Genesis chapter 12. We'll begin in verse 9. This is going to give us the story of Abraham facing a famine. In your Bible, this is the first famine that appears. There are several famines that show up in the Bible. In America, we don't see famine. We don't have to worry about famine. We got McDonald's on every corner. Not that anybody would want to eat there, but <laughs> I just saw where a guy in Russia stocked his refrigerator full of McDonald's cheeseburgers before they closed all the restaurants. I guess they're closing them over there. I don't know that I'd call that a restaurant. But. And so now it's worth all of this money in Russia because he's got this cheeseburger that nobody can buy and now he's stockpiled it. But, <laughs> okay, well, they're about to receive some semblance of a famine. They can't go to McDonald's. <laughs> okay, well, imagine if that was all the food in the land. Well, that's the way Abraham is. He says there's a famine. We can't get food. Now, he thinks there's food down in Egypt. He's been told it. I don't know where he got that idea, but for some reason, he thinks that there's food down there. What he's going to end up doing is following fear around. He's been following God. God said, I'll show you the land I want you to go to. Go here, go there. And that's the promised land. God didn't ever promise him Egypt. He promised him the promised land, but fear showed, fear showed up, and he says, I better follow fear. <laughs> Genesis 12, verse 9. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south, and there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come uh, near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know thou art a fair woman to look upon. Not mediocre. Fair meaning good. <laughs> Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken unto Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had all the riches a man could want. He had sheep and oxen and asses and manservant and maidservants and she asses and camels. That's not on our list of wealthiness. <laughs> but it was back then. He's proved how wealthy he is. Verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called unto Abram and said, What is this thou hast done unto me? And why, hast thou, uh, why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? And why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to... Uh, taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Whew. Good plan, but it went to pot real quick. <laughs> he thought it was a good plan anyway. All right, let's notice quickly some points and then we'll be done. The first thing we see in verse 10 is the problem. The problem is there's a famine. The famine has shown up. Guess what? In your life, there's going to be a problem. Always. You may have solved yesterday's problem, but you've not seen tomorrow's yet. <laughs> you could imagine tomorrow's, but when you get to tomorrow, it'll be a different one than you thought of. <laughs> okay, problems do show up. The problem here was the famine. But famine has never been the guide for Abraham. God didn't say, get up, leave your family, and I'll create a famine in order to guide you around the world. <laughs> no, famine is not the director. Famine is simply a pager. Remember, we used to have those years ago. I didn't. Well, I did one time. I had a pager when, I guess that was Rachel. When Rachel was being born, the hospital gave me a pager 
so that Toby could page me when she was going into labor. Okay, well, they had these little pagers. What that pager does is it beeps you, and it says, call this number. <laughs> okay, that's what a famine's doing. A famine is saying, call God, find out what's going on. Well, Abraham did not. A famine is not the only means of trouble he can get involved in. <laughs> and we're about to find him get into some more. The famine is a test for Abraham. And he's going to fail it. And he's going to fail it pretty dramatically. And that's good. Aren't you glad he failed that test? So that we can look at it and know, don't do that. If he had stayed and everything went well, we would read it and say, that's not me. Uh, he has nothing in common with me. <laughs> but he failed so we can see it and say, okay, I'm going to come up to some situations that are tough too. And I better not do what he did. In Jeremiah 14, verse 22. Jeremiah 14, verse 22. This is the heathen mindset that was all around him at this time. No wonder he was thinking the way he was thinking. Jeremiah chapter uh, four, uh, 14, verse 22. Are there any among the vanities of the heathen that can cause rain? Can a heathen make it rain? They thought they could. Even in America, the Indians did that. They had a little rain dance. <laughs> they thought that was going to make the sky pour with water. Didn't work for them. He goes on and he says, uh, Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we, what's that? Wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. It's only God who can give rain. Sorry, little Indian dancer. <laughs> it's not going to work. God will send the rain if he wants to. And he'll hold it if he wants to. It's up to him. Now, in modern times, <clears throat> they're trying to control the weather. Mm -hmm. They want to decide it's going to rain or it's going to be cloudy or we're going to do this or we're going to do that to it. <clears throat> no, you're not. There's going to be a global warming plan that God's got in mind for this mess down here. It's going to all melt with a fervent heat. And it won't do it a day earlier than he says do it. Amen. <laughs> he controls it. So Abraham decided he was going to go find a spot that had plenty of food rather than ask the one who produces food. According to our verse, the key is to wait upon thee. That's hard to do. It's hard to wait. I don't like waiting rooms. Hmm, no. I ain't waiting for nothing. This is America. This is Burger King. We can get whatever we want right away, you know. Psalm chapter 27. Psalm 27 verse 14. We're so impatient, I'll just make you read the first word. Wait. <laughs> he says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. When's he going to strengthen it? Didn't say. Just said wait. You'll get strength, but just wait. I know you're not strong right now. Wait. He will strengthen it. Wait. Did you hear me? I, turn your other, other ear to me. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Says it twice. Must be pretty important. Well, Abraham didn't. He wasn't waiting. He wasn't listening. In Lamentations, he says this, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope. Ah, you know what? A lot of Christians don't. They miss that part. They don't hope. Some of the most pessimistic people you meet are Christians who've got all their doctrine right, but they have no hope. Okay? As a Christian, we have hope. Amen. God has all the answers. And do you think there's any failure with God? No. Okay. So he's got all the answers. Everything's perfect with God. Just wait. You'll see it too. He says here, both hope and quietly wait. That's a hard one to do too. I could, sometimes I can wait. 
Not often can I quietly wait <laughs> for the salvation of the Lord. Abraham did not do that. He should have. He should have. He got into a mess. Man, <clears throat> it seems, is always tempted to wander when he should wait. The feet want to move when they're supposed to stay put. Okay, next thing we'll see in our passage, uh, Genesis 12, verse 11. I call this perception. Genesis 12, verse 11. You'll see down in there, he says, it says, And he said, that's the mouth moving, Behold, that is, use your eyeballs, I know I got a great mind. <laughs> and none of it was right. But he thought it was. He's got the Egyptian mentality before he's even entered the country. But he's already thinking like him. He said, that's his mouth moving. Behold, that is, open your eyes and you'll see what I'm seeing. And I know I'm brilliant. <laughs> we don't know everything we think we know. In fact, if you look back over your life, the problems and the things you were just so sure of 10 years ago, you no longer are. I'll tell you another one. People nowadays have the, the politics of America. Maybe it's, I've just, my eyes have just been open to it, but it seems like just in recent years to me, people have been predicting all the future as though they know there's some great political plan in place and here's what's going to happen. And we wait and we wait and it doesn't happen. Somebody else says just the opposite. They know it's going to do this and this. And that doesn't happen either. <laughs> okay, a lot of times we don't know what we think we know. I mean, it looked good at one time, but now it doesn't. Okay, you better ask God. He's the only one that's got all knowledge. Amen. And he's going to show us. And you know, if he doesn't show you another thing, then he doesn't want you to move. When you don't know where to go, because you already got where you're going. <laughs> In the second Corinthians verse, we all know, he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. If you're supposed to be moving, it shouldn't be with your eyeballs. If you're supposed to be walking, it's with faith. Okay, faith is something the world doesn't understand. Doesn't make sense to them. It does to a Christian. And that's the way we move. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, he says this, While we look not at the things which are seen, that's what you could behold, but at the things which are not seen, that's faith. For the things which are seen are temporal. Abraham's little journey to Egypt was a lot more temporal than he had imagined it to be. He got down there, realized he needed a new plan. And he was smart. He came up with a new plan. That one fell apart. And they told him, get. Get out of here. Okay, a lot more temporal than he thought it was going to be. He says, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Walking by faith. That'll get you where, where you need to go eternally. In Romans 8, he says this. But if we hope for that, we see not. Something God tells you. Something you have to believe. You take it on faith. For if we hope for that, we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. Hmm. Okay. That's what Abraham should have got a hold of. Now, I'm not saying that He's a, he's a wicked man or anything. I'm just saying he made the same mistakes we make all the time. That's right. <laughs> and I'm glad that he did them so we can learn from it. And guess what? You're going to make some mistakes too. You're going to get it wrong a time or two. Every day. Um, <laughs> however, you know, God has high praise for Abraham. Abraham's called the friend of God. He's... He's exalted for his faith. He's in the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. He's, he's said to be strong in faith in Romans. God's grading on a curve. Good thing. <laughs> because we're going to need that kind of grade. Amen. He says right here what we should do is with patience, wait. 
Hebrews 10, verse 38, he says this. Now the just shall live by faith. That's a law of God. It's a fact. It's like something we, we think of as a law of nature. It's not a law of nature. It's a law of God. It's called gravity. <laughs> you jump off the building, you don't fly. <laughs> or you learn. You reinforce God's law by jumping off the building. God's got a law. He says right here, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You want to make God happy? I hope you do. He says you're going to have to walk by faith. He says live by faith. He says if you don't live by faith, I don't have pleasure in you. And he said it was possible. You could draw back. Hmm. Matter of fact, we do all the time. <laughs> all right, one more point and we'll uh, not be done. <laughs> the next thing we'll see is the plague. God shows up and does something here to fix the situation. Abraham is down there and he's cooked up a plan. We're going to make Sarah, his half-sister, into his full-blown sister. And they're just, you know, family traveling together. No, nah, not a good plan. I don't know who came up with this, and I don't know why she went along with it. Whew. From Abraham's point of view, would that make any sense either? I would not want to be Abraham if a king has decided, I believe you, she's your sister, now she's my wife. Wouldn't you rather be dead? Okay, if they're going to kill me anyway, if, she's, if they're so strong and she's going to be their wife, you're going to take me out first. <laughs> I'm going to die. But no, that was not his plan. His plan was, well, I'll just... Sounds like just a little wimp, doesn't it? I'll just, I'll just let you be living over there. And I'll, no. <laughs> Craziness. But that's what happens if you're not following God. You don't have clear. He says that we get a sound mind from the Word of God. That's the only way that our mind works right is when we get God to tell us what it should say and think. Otherwise, we just make a mess of it. And that's what Abraham's doing. The plague shows up. This is the mercy and grace of God, even though it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> In Genesis 12, 18, this this plague hits and Pharaoh comes to Abraham and he says this what is this thou hast done unto me he's blaming the plague on Abraham you know what it was Abraham's fault Abraham had attempted to be acceptable to Egypt he didn't want to offend anybody he showed up in town telling lies in order to be acceptable nope as Christians we're not supposed to be acceptable to the world we're going to offend them now you don't go out of your way to do it God will offend them <laughs> without you getting involved <laughs> so just let it happen the way it's supposed to but don't try to fit into them don't try to be a chameleon God didn't create chameleons he created Christians People like Christ, not like everything around them. He ignored God, and when he did that, it endangered all of Egypt. Or for sure, Pharaoh's house. That's who God plagued. He pulls the same phony story that he just saw fall apart a few years later. A few years later, he doesn't quite make it all the way down to Egypt. He stops about halfway there. And Abimelech gets the same line. This is my sister. Well, in that story, God shows up in a dream. Says, Abimelech, don't touch her. That's another man's wife. Abimelech says, yes, sir. <laughs> Abimelech told him this. Almost the same thing that we've already heard. Abimelech says this in chapter 20. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, that mouth moving, because I thought, man's thoughts that were wrong, 
Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. <laughs> Man's reasoning is no good, and you know what? You may fail the test two or three times. <laughs> That's okay. Got to keep testing you. The test will come back. It seems like almost an identical situation here. A famine. He flees. Tells the same lie. Gets caught. <laughs> At some point it clicked. Hebrews remembers him as a great man of faith. And he was. Because God said he was. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. When God levies out the curses. You remember the fall of man. And woman. <laughs> we say man meaning human. Genesis 3 17. It says. And unto Adam. He said. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Did the ground do anything? Nope. Wasn't the ground's fault. It was Adam's fault. But the ground got cursed. You know, if a Christian won't live right, he curses those around him. Your sin reaches out beyond you. Always has, always will. I think the reason that the world is in such a disastrous state that it's in right now is not so much that there's so much wickedness here. There's always been wickedness in the world. It's that the Christians who should know better don't live better. Their sin is causing God to levy curses to an extreme. That's what happened in Pharaoh's house. God sent a plague. Not because of Pharaoh, but because of Abraham the liar. Ooh. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14 verse 34. The Bible says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I understand he's not talking church age here, so I'm going to say some things and spiritualize some things in order to make an application. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, in our age, we don't see much righteousness. Therefore, we don't see righteous nations. Nations being exalted. As far as the nations are concerned, you stack them up, and America would be on the top. Historically, we've been a righteous nation. A nation of righteous people. Not so much anymore. Now we're beginning to see the next half of that. Sin is a reproach to any people, the saved or the lost people. Sin reproaches. Now, I think just to comparing it with our story about Abraham, the sin of the Christians is caused the reproach to fall on even the heathen that God might not have done before. Ooh. In Isaiah 37, the Bible says this, Isaiah 37, 35, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, we've seen sin affect the whole world. Sin affected Pharaoh's house that Pharaoh didn't have anything to do with. How about this one? This is a reversal. God says, I'm going to defend this city, Jerusalem, for my own sake. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, isn't it? And then he says, not only that, there was somebody else here, a human, that I could say I'll do it for him. It was David's sake. So that righteousness has reaped a protection for many, many years to come. Hmm, pretty good. If we'll live right, we could affect the outcome for those around us for years to come. Just like if you live wrong, That'll affect them too. In Matthew 5, the Bible says this, But I say unto you, that uh, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. He says right there, you could cause somebody to fall into sin. We can our life has to be lived circumspect, 
or not only the sin that we incur uh, reaps a rep repercussion from God, but we could cause somebody else to get into sin. Oof. Sin is an infectious disease, I say. It is. We've seen some of those lately. COVID. COVID has no comparison to sin. Sin is a thousand times, six billion times worse than COVID ever dreamed of or the government ever dreamed of. <laughs> because sin, unlike COVID, has no cure. There's no booster shot you can get for sin. Sin has no bounds except one. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, that's basically our message today. I'll just give you one close. In closing, I'll see the path, how he got back. What did it take to get Abraham back where he needed to be? Okay, we've seen the, the flight. He was afraid and the famine was so terrible. Well, he made it back. Let's find him get back. In chapter 12, look at verse 18. The world, it was the heathen that became the messengers of God. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Abraham was given the promised land. He runs from the promised land and God doesn't say, you're done. I'll find me a new Abraham. <laughs> Abraham number two. <laughs> he didn't. He said, I'll find me a better preacher than you. Come here, heathen. Pharaoh. Tell my preacher a message. So Pharaoh preaches to him. Pharaoh's message in verse 18 is, they sent him away. Get out of here. <laughs> Look at the next chapter, chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and where Abraham called on the name of the Lord. That's a good one right there. He had to get back to the spot he left. God's not silent so much to us as that we walk away so we can't hear him. If you get too far from God, he can still be talking and you can't hear him. Okay, as a Christian, you open the book, that's him talking. If you can't hear it, it's because you got something else in your ears. Right. Get the wax out. <laughs> The famine, obviously, was okay because he, it was sustained. He lived through it. It didn't kill him. We don't read about any of his household dying. So famine was not the, the big bad bear that made himself out to be in the beginning. We always rejoin God where we left God. He had to get back to where he left. He fled from a good spot. Okay, go right back there. Where you leave God is where you find God. And the most important thing, in order to alter his behavior, he needed to find him an altar. <laughs> no pun intended. For a Christian, we need that altar all the time. That's communication with God. Now, there has to be a balance on it. There's big emphasis on you talking to God and not much on him talking to you. It probably should be twice as much him talking to you as you opening your mouth. But don't ignore the fact that we've been given the right to speak. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. That's a privilege, and we should use it. 